Uh, this morning we're going to um, continue uh, with our uh, verse by verse study of the book of First Timothy, and um, it's been uh, obviously a few weeks because we were out of town. Um, uh, it's been a few weeks since uh, since we were there looking at First Timothy. But um, if you rem remember uh, to any degree what we've dealt with here in First Timothy, First Timothy can be con you know uh, kind of difficult at times. Um, it can be controversial talks about things about rulers and who's supposed to be in charge and women's responsibilities and, and bishops' responsibilities and servants or slaves, you need to do this. And it can get, you know, you know, difficult to accept things. Well, let me give you a hint. It's not getting any easier today, okay? So the things that we're going to be looking at today may challenge you, and it may challenge what you've been um, under the belief um, in the past. And so be ready to be challenged. Um, but like I've always told you, don't take my word for it. You study it. Be convinced in your own mind. You, you see if what, what we're saying is true. And some people say, you know, maybe we use too many verses. Well, the reason why we use a lot of verses is to make sure that I'm teaching the Word of God and not my opinion. Okay? So that's, that's the situation. And so today's text can be a tough one. Um, I don't believe it's tough to teach. I don't think it's tough to teach at all, but it can be tough to apply. Um, it's pretty simple enough to teach because it's pretty plain what Paul is saying here. Um, and he's saying it through the inspiration of God. Um, but like I said, much of 1 Timothy um, can be difficult. I want to start this morning actually in the book of Psalms. Turn with me to Psalm 119, verse 63. Psalm 119, verse 63. Here the writer of Psalms says, I am a, a companion of all them that fear thee, and of them that keep thy precepts. Here the writer talks about somebody whom they associate with. And today in the book of First Timothy, we're going to be talking about who we should be associating with, and really more to the point, who we shouldn't be associating with. So let's pray before we actually get into our verses. Father, I want to just come before your throne of grace this morning, and I just want to thank you for your word. And, and Father, as we open it up today, and as we um, can be challenged through what's being presented here, Father, I just pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment. Um, but most importantly, Father and Lord, that we would accept your word as true. Um, and, and so, Father, help us to accept it and help us to understand it. Um, and we know that uh, we give you glory not just by saying we give you glory, but by how we live our lives and the things that we do. And so, Father, that's our hope and our desire. Amen. Who we keep our company with, and again, as I said, more to the point, who we shouldn't um, is an issue that many, if not most, Christians fail to understand and apply. Most Christians don't really uh, you know, want to take this subject on because in this day and age, we have people in our lives that we don't really want this to have to interfere with things. Um, sometimes the emotion of situations or relationships can get in in the way. You ever heard of the, the Dewey train? You guys ever heard of the Dewey train? It's kind of about the train that talks about the order of the, um, the train itself. In the very beginning, you've got doctrine. Doctrine is supposed to be the head, the front of that train. Then you've got intellect, will, and guess what's at the last? Emotion. Emotion is the last thing. Emotion can be good. Emotion is something that God gave us and that we should have. But emotion driving the train will be problematic. We need to understand that doctrine is what leads the train. Instruction from God. Sometimes your emotions are going to get in the way. And the wise person understands this. So when we deal with issues like what we're going to be dealing with here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Well, let's just read 1 Timothy chapter 6. 
start in verse 3. It's where we left off. It says, If any man teach otherwise, which we'll look at what that... He's obviously talking about some of what was before, but he says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, notice this is that wasn't the end of the sentence. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof comes envy, strife, railings, evil, surmisings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, <laughs> supposing that gain is godliness. Now he's going to conclude the sentence. He says, from such withdraw thyself. Remove yourself is what he's saying. Okay? Um, now again, this can be, um, I, again, I think it's pretty straightforward. Believe it or not, Paul says this many, many times, the fact that we need to withdraw ourselves from, from certain individuals. But a lot of people misunderstand, you know. They don't want to deal with this situation. And they, they ask questions, and they're legitimate questions. Um, and we're, we need to be prepared to answer. Didn't Jesus sit with the sinners and go to the brothels, people will say? But didn't he, didn't he go make friends with them? No, he didn't. It's not what he did. Close to what he did, but that's not what he did. There's a big misunderstanding, and it's because of that misunderstanding that you have huge misapplication. Okay? Does God want you to evangelize the lost? You betcha He wants you to do that. Does God want you to surround yourself with non-believers or even Christians that are rebelling against His Word? Absolutely not. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's not a matter of question. He does not want you to surround yourself with anyone who is rebelling against his word and his instruction. Does that mean that you, as we'll talk about later, that you can't interact with them? Of course not. But it's important that you understand what God teaches on this. William Gladstone said, Choose wisely your companions. For a young man's companions, more than his food or clothes, his home or his parents, make him what he is. And you know who agrees with that? God. God agrees with that. He's not the only one that believes that. God believes that. Whenever you associate yourself with the wrong people, it will have effects on you. And God does not want you to associate with those people. I mean, it's pretty common sense here. Parents, do you generally want your kids hanging out with the ones that are really rebellious? Other friends of your kids? Do you want them hanging about? Why? Don't you want them to be a good influence on them? You know, the ones that are out there, you know, whether they're in gangs or whatever they're doing, fill in the blank. Don't you want your good kid to be that good influence? Of course not. You don't want your kid hanging around with them. Why? Because you know how it works. You know that the influence of the bad is going to affect your child. Do you think it's any different with God? He understands the same thing. He doesn't want you hanging around with those who are rebelling against Him. He wants you to, to evangelize them. He wants you to rebuke them. He wants to reprove them. But He doesn't want you to be hanging around with them. And here Paul says in verse 3, if any man teach otherwise, um, and he says, consent not to wholesome words. And obviously wholesome words are going to be words of Jesus, right? And he says, not um, who don't consent to the doctrine. Paul has just got done elaborating on the responsibility of a servant, uh, meaning a slave, somebody who is a slave, and their responsibility to esteem their masters as worthy of all honor. And so he says here, if any man teach otherwise, but he's not just you know, narrowing this down to only that situation. Paul here, what is he talking about when he says anybody who teach otherwise or these wholesome words? Um, what Paul says to do with these things is he wants you to withdraw. And yes, that can be very you know, extreme. But what does he mean by this otherwise, the teach otherwise? Well, wholesome has the idea is being profitable, something that is edifying, 
something that is nourishing. And if it's not wholesome, wholesome if it's not profitable, if it's not edifying, if it's not nourishing, um, then he doesn't want you around them. And so Paul here is not just talking about if you've got servants who won't obey their masters, then you need to withdraw from them. He's not just talking about that group. He's talking about doctrine as a whole. Whenever they won't conform to sound doctrine, doctrine as a whole, that's who he's, who he's referring to. Don't forget, turn me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul begins this book, the epistle, with a warning and, and a charge um, with, with Timothy. 1 Timothy 1 verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Paul's whole point through, through this 1 Timothy is about sound doctrine is what he's talking about. And now he's telling, telling the people, he says, that you need to withdraw yourself from these people who, who won't uh, conform to this sound doctrine, who deny it, who are teach otherwise. The um, idea of who, where this sound doctrine comes from can also come into play in this situation. Um, I'm not going to ask you, but and, and I'm not condemning you, but if you've got a red letter edition of the Bible, do you understand that how how many people have been confused by that? Again, it's not wrong for you to have a red letter edition. Matter of fact, um, just out of um, something interesting here in your reference sheet, there's a little red letter that I have on there. Um, but when Paul is talking about wholesome words. Doctrine. He's talking about the doctrine in which he is revealed. He's talking about um, Jesus' words, and he's not just talking about, as some would say here, the Gospels. Again, some people don't recognize that Paul's words were Jesus' words. And they look at the red letter of edition, the red letter edition of the Bible, and they say, "Those are Jesus's words. Those are what I'm going to listen to because those are Jesus's words." There's a problem there because you have a whole lot more of Jesus's words that aren't in red letters. Amen. And Paul is saying, if you got people and they're not adhering to sound doctrine, wholesome words, you need to withdraw yourself. So you better understand what it is, these wholesome words. Look at Acts chapter 20 with me. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. And if you have your handout, you'll see that on there. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. He says, I have showed you all things. How that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. How he said, and if you've got a red letter edition of the Bible, I bet this is in red. <laughs> it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now the reason I point this out is because that's not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Think about that. This is the words of Jesus and it didn't come from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Your red letter edition in Paul here is quoting the Lord Jesus Christ. And it wasn't from the Old Testament, obviously, and it certainly wasn't from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So when did Jesus say this? Well, let me give you a hint. The same time he said all the other things that he said to Paul, the Apostle Paul. And Paul here is using this, and as you can see here, these are the words of Jesus. And Paul makes it clear his teachings are none other than the words of Jesus. Look at 1 Thessalonians with me. Chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians 4, verse 1. <clears throat> Paul says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. Now notice that wording here. By the Lord Jesus. Paul is exhorting. He's the one speaking, but he's saying, I'm exhorting you by Jesus. What is that telling you? It's telling you that it's Jesus. 
that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Well, where did Paul get that commandment? Did he just like wait for the first edition of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to come out and start walking around and, and tell everybody what that said? No. The risen Lord Jesus Christ appeared to the Apostle Paul many times, and he taught him just like he taught Peter, just like he taught everybody else. And so when the, when the risen Lord, whenever he gave Paul words, it was no different than when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus said them there. It's the same thing. Look on down here to verse 8, 1 Thessalonians 4, 8. He says, He therefore that despised, despised not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Do you understand? Paul's message was, you want to despise what I'm saying? You're not despising me. You're despising the Lord Jesus Christ himself, because these are his words. So whenever you're thinking about 1 Timothy 6, the idea of whoever doesn't um, conform or understand or teaches anything other than sound doctrine, if it doesn't align to the Pauline teaching, then it doesn't align to Jesus' teaching. And that's what he's saying here. Either Paul is a liar, and we can just throw out all of his epistles, or his words are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are your options. He was either a liar, or those are His commands, meaning Jesus. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 37. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. He says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now let that sink in. If anyone thinks of themselves to be a prophet, which we don't have today, or spiritual, in order for that to be true, you've got to acknowledge that Paul's words are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's what he's saying. His words are the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 13, 1, he says, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And that should remind you what we talked about in First Timothy earlier about don't, don't take a, an accusation against an elder beyond two or three witnesses. And I told you, hey, that's not something special for elders. That's just the way it always was with God. And that should remind you of that. But he says, this third time I am coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write unto them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. Yeah, that's, I've seen some of your eyes on this. You, you should be looking at it this way. This is Paul saying, you don't want me to come and, and, and have to deal with this. You want it handled before I come. He says, because I won't spare. Since, verse 3, you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. I want you to note the tone of Paul here. You seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, and you've got these issues. Whenever I come, I'm not going to spare. In other words, be careful. There's a serious warning in Paul uh, to these people. My hope is that we can put ourselves in some of these positions and realize the seriousness of dismissing the teachings of Paul. There's a lot of people out there that do that. They say that some people want to rob Peter to pay Paul, and you've heard me say before, no, the problem is people robbing Paul to pay Peter. Nothing against Peter. Peter's got a great ministry. 
to Israel. You want to know the truth for you? You better listen to Paul. Because otherwise you don't listen to anything that he says, and this Bible is useless. What's the big deal if people reject Paul's authority as the apostle of the church? Well, let me ask you this. Let's put it a different way, a way that would seem pretty obvious. Imagine asking a first um, century Jew or ask King David himself, what's the big deal about rejecting Moses' authority? <clears throat> that, that, they would pretty much realize you're, you're crazy. Moses speaks for God. Moses went on the mountain before God, and God spoke to him and gave him the commandments, and of course we're going to listen to him. Is it any different for us today than whenever God gave Paul those instructions? Is it any different? You want to know the answer to that, that question. It's not even a hypothetical question. You can go to Numbers chapter 12, and I would suggest you go read Numbers chapter 12 because you had Moses' brother and sister question Moses' authority, and you can see firsthand how God reacted to that. Moses' brother and sister quickly heard the voice of God whenever they wouldn't listen to whom he chose. If you're familiar with the story, Numbers chapter 12, you go there. Whenever they began to question Moses, God, Moses doesn't even go to God to complain. Moses hears about it, and he says, Aaron, Miriam, get to the tent. And he speaks to them. And he reminds them quickly, oh, I may talk to other people in dreams, and I may talk to people in visions, but Moses I speak to directly. How did Jesus speak to the Apostle Paul? Who was the one that said that about Moses? That was the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. So now understand the seriousness. Just as serious as rejecting what Moses' authority and him being sent by God, it is no less a rejection of God than when you reject, when you reject Paul. At least that's the way I see it. So yeah, there's a big deal. Turn me to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, who wrote Thessalonians? Paul. Paul. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Well, wait a minute, Paul. I mean, he's a good friend of mine. You know, he's my neighbor. And we've been friends for years. We went to college together, Paul. What are you, what are you asking here? Do you, do you see a but here? You see what I'm saying? He says, note that man if they won't acknowledge what this says, and have no company with him. Look up at, uh, oh goodness, verse 6. He says, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Paul is laying it straight, guys. He's saying, I'm commanding you by the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, this is why I say to you, either Paul is a liar or he is speaking directly for God himself. There's your choices. Pick one. I'll warn you. Be careful about rejecting whom God sends to be his messenger. God had, had warned Israel day and night about that type of thing. We've got to be careful with that kind of thing. There are ramifications for rejecting truth. Let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul is going to talk about um, really what's behind some of this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, talking about the ones who... Um, who are rejecting or teaching otherwise, who consent not to wholesome words, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine. He says he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words. Where comes envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings? 
of men of corrupt minds. Notice this, destitute of the truth. If, if the truth comes from Jesus Christ and you're not listening to Jesus Christ, guess what you're destitute of? You're destitute of the truth. It's not a, well, I'll take some of it kind of a thing. You either take what Jesus says or you don't. And he says here that if they're not listening, then they're destitute to the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, which we will deal with that next week, uh, what, what's really going on with that. And he says, from such withdraw thyself. There's a quote, couldn't find who, who said it, but it says, you sow a thought and you reap a deed. You sow a deed and you reap a habit. You sow a habit and you reap a character. You sow a character and you reap a destiny. There's effects from rejecting the truth. There always is, there always has been, and there always will be. If you reject the truth, there are ramifications. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, I think I put that in your, your handout there, it says, be not deceived. This is Paul, God. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. This goes right back to the beginning of what we talked about here. The idea that whom we associate with, those communications that we have, <clears throat> they will corrupt character, manners, they will corrupt these things. Again, it's common sense. You're not going to have your kids hang around, hang around with, with bad influences. Why would you? Now, a couple of things I want to talk about. Uh, in this is uh, when how this is to be done withdrawing um, how it shouldn't be done but keep in mind that it is to be done and some want to rationalize and, I, and, I, and I've kept out probably 10 or two, well 10 might be a little bit much uh, a number of verses where Paul is explaining this exact thing that you need to withdraw yourself that you need not to be around these people some try to rationalize Paul's instructions to withdraw, think that he's just referring to teaching about servants, or that Paul is just referring to teachers need to withdraw themselves. You know, I'm a pastor, therefore, as a pastor, I shouldn't be hanging out with him. But it's okay if you guys do it. Well, that's silly. If, you're, if you have a teacher that stands up in the church and says, I'm going to be a teacher, and he teaches, teaches wrong doctrine, then he should be kicked out. He, he should be removed. Uh, well, obviously, you don't have people teaching false stuff at the church, but as we've already seen, and again, there's many other verses here that we can look at, and we're going to look at some more here in a minute. It's not just teachers. We already read in 2 Second, Second Thessalonians that we need to withdraw ourselves from those who walk disorderly. <laughs> walk disorderly. Not just people who think or teach, but those who walk disorderly. Is what that said. Turn me to Romans, Romans 16, verse 17. Romans 16, verse 17. Romans 16, verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Again, what, what is Paul saying here? You mark those who are causing divisions. How do you cause divisions in the church? Is it because I like this color chair and you like this color chair? Is it because I like this music and you like this music? Paul's concerned about those who are causing divisions based on the doctrine. Whenever they won't align themselves, when people won't align themselves to correct doctrine, mark them and avoid them. Mark and avoid is what it says. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, 1 Corinthians 5, 9. This is an interesting verse for a different reason. Um, I'll give you that nugget of truth and maybe it'll interest you and you may, um, may enjoy that. He says here in verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Um, what book are you in right now? First Corinthians. And he says, I wrote you an epistle already. See, keep in mind, there are things that Paul wrote that weren't Scripture. Uh, and I can't wait to meet him and find out other things. 
because he did write things that weren't Scripture. The Holy Spirit guided and directed what Scripture is. But here he mentions, here you got this nugget of truth, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or else, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must you needs to go out of the world, that isn't a license to say, oh, okay, so I can go hang out with them. We can go have a, you know, a party together. No, he's saying he's acknowledging that you, it's not that you can totally remove yourself because in order to do that, you'd have to pull yourself out of the world. That's what he's talking about. Don't look for an excuse to hang out with the bad people, people. You know, don't look for justification. Look for the truth. He says, verse 11, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. Is there any ambiguity here is what Paul is teaching? I don't think so. There's none here whatsoever, my friends. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter three, verse one. We're going to look down through verse eight. Second Timothy three one says, "This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce bakers, false accusers." And keep in mind that these aren't signs. Don't get caught up in the signs. These are warnings, okay? There's a difference between a sign and a warning. He's warning people. You know, these aren't signs that because, oh my goodness, look at how bad everybody is. This must be the last days. Trust me, things have been bad for a long time. These things have existed, well, since Paul, before then. So don't look at them as signs. Warnings, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers various lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Notice this next verse. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, you remember when Moses went before Pharaoh and he threw down his rod and it turned into the, the serpent and you had Pharaoh's two men get up and go back and forth with uh, Moses. Those two withstood Moses. And he says, now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. And Paul is saying, don't be part of that. Separate yourself. What's the words he hears? From such turn away. You see, if you pay attention to the wording that Paul uses throughout this, it's always you doing it. It's you turn away. You withdraw yourself is what he's saying. You be active in this. You do it. Now, I get the fact that what Paul is asking here is hard. I get that. It's not without compassion that I preach, preach this situation or preach this message. Again, we're preaching, I'm preaching this not, not because I want to, I'm preaching it because we're going over the book of 1 Timothy. Maybe you don't want to withdraw from your friend who calls himself a Christian and lives as in whatever you know, lifestyle you want to call it, whether it's homosexual, whatever the case may be. Maybe you don't want to withdraw yourself from that. I get that. I understand it. But are you prepared to say, not my will be done, but thine own? Are you prepared to say that? Are you prepared to say, I know I don't want to do it, but what has God said? Well, I hope so. It's a quote by George Washington. He says, associate yourself with men of good quality if you esteem your reputation. 
For it's better to be alone than in bad company. If your reputation can be smeared by your associations, can God's reputation be smeared by your associations? Yes. The Bible is full of God saying that very same thing. Israel, my name is blaspheme among the Gentiles because of you. This isn't easy. Neither is easy telling a slave to honor his master. Neither is telling a wife to submit to her husband. Neither is telling a husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church. Neither is telling anyone the things that we must do. But if you remember right in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it is God's will for all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God has a plan and he's using us. And this is how he's deemed to use us. Do you trust him? That's the question. Do you trust him? There really is two reasons. I'll try to wrap this up. There really is two reasons why Christians are called to withdraw from others. First one is for that person's accountability. First Timothy 1.20, we saw an example of that. First Timothy 1.20, Paul says, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Here Paul delivered these two who were teaching false doctrine. He was teaching, teaching things that don't lie to Paul's doctrine, and he delivers them unto Satan. In other words, he turned them over. He withdrew himself. He pulled, pulled them away. He turns them over. Why? It says you why, that they may learn. That they may learn. The first reason why we withdraw from others is for their accountability. The second reason is for preservation of you, preservation of self, preservation of um, the church, preservation of your family, preservation of doctrine. Because I can promise you, I can promise you, the Old Testament's full of examples where God's doctrine was blasphemed by people because they began to let things, other things slip in. That's the warning. Did God call Israel to be separate from the nations? <coughs> Let me give you a hint. Why did God call Israel to be separate? Was it because he, God was racist? Did God hate the rest of the world? Or did God have a plan of salvation to reach the rest of the world through Israel? That's what he did. God has a plan to reach the rest of the world through us. And he says, I know the best way to do it. Come out of them. Withdraw yourself from them. He tells Israel, be holy for I am holy. That's what he says. He's made you holy. What does holy mean? Separate. He's made you separate from these things. And you need to be separated from those things, is what he says. Now, the last thing I'll mention here is there is a right way and a wrong way to do this. There's, there's some groups that separate, um, or there's some people that would separate, and they do it completely wrong. Look, well, start with 2 Thessalonians, really quick. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 15. 2 Thessalonians 3, 15. It's not enough for me to share what and teach what I have. You have to understand him, understand this. We read verse 14, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. When you withdraw yourself, that doesn't mean now all of a sudden you give snide looks and you're mean to them or that you're somehow um, rude to them or that you refuse friendly greetings to them. It doesn't mean that you're smug. It doesn't mean that you're mean. You don't count them as an enemy, but you, as it says here, admonish him as a brother. You might ask, well, how do you admonish him? Well, if you withdraw yourself, well, keep in mind here, it's not suggesting um, that you have to refuse even a friendly greeting or, um, for an example, I wrote down a couple examples here. Somebody dies. It's not saying that you can't go to a funeral, but let me tell you something. 
your friend who, who's a b believer who who's, falls in this cat category, it's not saying that you can't go to that person's funeral because their spouse died, but there's a difference between going to a funeral and going to a picnic with them. Do you see the difference? You have to have the discernment in understanding this. You have to understand that there's a difference between counting somebody as an enemy and withdrawing yourself. There's a difference between helping a brother who's lost a spouse that's died or even a brother whose house is burnt down and you want to aid and you want to help. There's a difference between doing something like that and going to a picnic or a party with them. There's a difference between going to a funeral with somebody and going to somebody's birthday party. I hope you can see the difference because you need to understand Withdraw yourself isn't mean, doesn't mean that all of a sudden we can't say hi to the person, that we have to be mean to the person. No, it just means that you withdraw yourself from them. That you're not having that fellowship like you did before is all that's talking about. Now, but the most important thing here that Paul is talking about here is because as we talked about in 1 Timothy 2, God has a desire for all to be saved. And that's our responsibility. Our responsibility is to share that gospel with the lost and dying world. The reason you're here, you've heard me say it many times, three jobs, right? Exalt the Lord Jesus. You will do that in glory. Edify the saints. You, you will be edified in, 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 in glory. But guess what? You cannot evangelize the lost when you're in glory. That happens now. It's the only time it can happen. Now is the time of salvation. And it's our responsibility as ambassadors. What is an ambassador? It's somebody who serves somebody or some administration or some authority in a foreign land. You are in a foreign land, my friends. We are in a foreign land. Let's share the gospel, the grace of God with the lost and dying world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for the truth of your word, even though it can be very difficult. Father, I pray for discernment and wisdom, compassion, Father, help us to, well, just to put you first, first in our lives. And so, Father, as, as we continue the service, as we um, have this memorial, this, this Lord's Supper, Father, I just pray that each of us can conform our lives to Christ more and more each day. We seek you for that. Father, we pray that if there's anybody here who's not put their faith and trust in Christ's finished work for their sins, pray that they would do so today. Amen.